start the broadcast. And we're live. Oh, just a second. This video is still live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Wellness Institute uh, Women's Heart Health today. Uh, what makes us different? Uh, we know there's differences uh, between men and women, specifically regarding heart health, and you'll soon find out uh, many of those differences. Today's uh, webinar, my name, first of all, is Karen Whalen. I'm the host of today's webinar. Uh, and the webinar will be facilitated by our case manager in cardiac rehabilitation, and that's Kendra Giris. And she's been... Um, involved in cardiac rehabilitation and cardiac heart health for many, many years. So she's uh, really well versed to talk to you today about this subject. Uh, she, along with being our case manager here at Wellness Institute for Cardiac Rehabilitation, she has also formerly been an educator with the inpatient cardiology and the interventional cardiology section of the Cardiac Sciences Program at St. Boniface Hospital. Ooh, it's a mouthful. Uh, as well, uh, Kendra has experience as an educator with the intensive care nursing program through the WRHA2. She teaches uh, ACLS and basic life support for heart and stroke. And um, as she's relayed to me, she's always been quite geeked out about heart health. It really excites her. So uh, she's excited to um, relay the information to you all today in our webinar. First, I'd just like to uh, share with you a little bit about the Wellness Institute. Many of you may be familiar with the Wellness Institute, uh, but we've been around a while now, uh, uh, over 20 years, and we are a certified not-for-profit uh, medical fitness facility in the north end of Winnipeg. And really our goal is to help optimize individuals' health wherever they might be. So in some cases, it's uh, looking at more preventative approach and other other times, like with our cardiac rehabilitation, it's it's working working with people um, through that rehabilitative process. Uh, again, helping improve their quality of life. Um, Today, throughout the webinar, you may have questions, and that's great. Um, so if you do have questions, you'll notice there's a chat box on the side of your screen. Please uh, feel free to type in a question. And to keep with the flow of the webinar, we're going to address those um, questions at the end of the webinar in a, in a question and answer period So um, to keep things moving along. So um, we're, we'll... I'm going to turn things over here now to um, to Kendra. And one last thing I'd like to note is that this webinar will be recorded, so um, it will be posted up onto our website and uh, archived in our webinar library. So if you have to sneak away a few minutes early, or maybe you want to share this webinar with friends who are unable to participate today, uh, there is that opportunity for them to, to do so and um, check it up on our library. So now I'd like to turn things over to our expert, uh, Kendra Giris. Here she is. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, we've got a lot of information to cover in, in half an hour. And um, so I'd just like to start off. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of research in the past 20 years. I've been involved in cardiology for at least that long, and uh, we've seen a lot of really great changes. Um, the topics that I'm going to talk about today uh, will not, unfortunately, ha we have time to include uh, valvular heart disease uh, in women, uh, arrhythmias, vascular disease, and stroke. Those are all topics for future webinars, maybe, Karen. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> if we can get those going. Um, but uh, it, like I said, in the last uh, few years, we've, we've realized that there are some definite myths and facts about women-specific heart health. Um, there was a long-standing premise that 
heart disease is a man disease, but it actually accounts for 41% of deaths in women are from heart disease. And that's more than all the cancers combined. Um, and heart disease is for old people, but uh, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of premature death uh, in women in Canada. And that's for women under the age of 45 years of age. Um, and of course, men's and women's hearts are the same, but they're not. They're actually quite different. Um, women's hearts are, are smaller because our bodies are generally smaller. The veins are finer. Uh, the electrical system is a little bit different as well. Um, women tend to have more palpitations. Their heart has a resting heart rate that is higher. Um, and since the system itself is more sensitive. Um, and the symptoms of disease do not present as easily in women as in, in men. And then after a heart event, like a heart attack, um, the vessels and the muscles are, are less durable. So women are at higher risk for certain diseases than, than men and lower risk for others. And I'll be talking about that quite a bit. Um, but the treatment for heart disease is largely based on clinical trials that have taken place over the past you know, 20 to 30 years um, on men. And so we've learned that sex differences do exist. Um, symptom presentation is different. Eff efficacy of diagnostic tests is different. So we've really come around to know that there are a lot of gender differences. Um, one of the things that's quite worrisome is that in the age group of 35 to 44 years of age in women, um, the, the death rate for ischemic heart disease uh, continues to increase in spite of globally the death rate for ischemic heart disease uh, in men and women of all ages is, uh, is decreasing. So there's definitely a little bit of a gap there. So just a little bit about some history. Um, in 1950s, there was a spike in articles about heart disease awareness, but they were largely uh, how do you take care of your man's heart <laughs> or your husband's heart. So um, in 1997, there was a, a, a survey in the US that found out that only 7% of women perceived that cardiovascular disease was a health threat. Um, so that was not that long ago, really. Um, Heart and Stroke and the American Heart Association uh, all did sort of a uh, awareness campaign um, in the 2000s and found that um, the awareness of cardiovascular disease in women did increase um, to 30% in 19, sorry, in, in 2004, and then it plateaued. Um, so now we're seeing a bit of a resurgence again in uh, the awareness of women's heart disease and we're seeing a, a, a lot more research. Uh, we need a, we have a long way to go, but we, we are seeing a lot of research recently. Um, what's really cool is that in Heart Month, uh, February, uh, Heart and Stroke um, released their 2020 um, Spotlight on Women's uh, Health and it's a fighting chance. Uh, and it, highlights some of the research that's being done on sort of women's specific heart disease. Uh, and it's interesting because last year in 2019, it was actually uh, the title of the article was disconnected. So I think we've come a long way in, in uh, doing some research on women's heart health. Then the AHA actually uh, published something just last week, the state of science in women's cardiovascular disease. Um, and so we're coming a long way. Uh, we still need, like I said, we still need a, a ways to go though. So the traditional risk factors for heart disease, ischemic heart disease, um, all of the ones on your screen here are preventable. So 80% of ischemic heart disease is preventable. And modifying these risk factors is, a, is an essential component to preventing ischemic heart disease in women. Um, these traditional risk factors are the same in women as in men, and they include um, the risk factor of being overweight or obesity. So the increased body weight is associated uh, with increased coronary risk. By statistics, believe it or not, more women are overweight than men in Canada. Um, managing cholesterol. So the other name that you'll hear from your doctor is dyslipidemia. 
So reduced high density lipoprotein or happy lipoprotein cholesterol and triglyceride levels are a powerful risk factor of coronary artery disease in women. Um, diabetes or managing blood sugar. Um, now, knowing what your blood sugar levels are, um, diabetes itself can be related to obesity and metabolic syndrome, and it's associated with a higher relative risk of heart events in women compared to men. So the diagnosis of diabetes actually increases your risk of uh, cardiovascular disease by 20%, which is sig significantly more than um, a man diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, high blood pressure, um, if high blood pressure is managed or hypertension is managed, the risk of heart attack can be reduced by 36%. So there's a, there's a lot of st statistics here, but these are proven statistics. Um, high blood pressure is more strongly associated with heart attack in women compared to men. Now smoking, this is my, my favorite one. Smoking is the single most important preventable cause of heart attack in women and a leading cause of heart attack in women less than 55 years of age. So there's that cohort of women that the risk of MI is increasing in spite of all of the technology that we have these days. Um, smoking increases their risk by sevenfold, which is very, very significant. So now, women specific. Um, these are some of the non-traditional risk factors. Now, I just want to talk really briefly. We have um, done a lot of research on risk factors, and that's where those, those traditional risk factors have come from. Um, if you've heard uh, your doctor talking about the Framingham risk score, it's a, it's a proven score that uh, family physicians and cardiologists uh, and, and practitioners punch your numbers in. So they punch your, your blood sugar and your, and your uh, blood pressure and your cholesterol numbers and your age, and they come out with sort of, you know, what's your 10-year risk or what's your five-year risk of, of having a heart event. Um, that works great for men because that has been proven in men. Now, we don't have a risk scoring system that is women-specific. So these non-traditional risk factors are something that you need to discuss with your family physician so that they're aware because these things have happened throughout your lifetime. So one of the things is polycystic ovarian system or syndrome, sorry. It's associated uh, with obesity and insulin resistance. So going back to that diabetes and then of course sleep apnea. Um, autoimmune inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis, like scleroderma, like systemic lupus erythematosus, um, those autoimmune diseases cause a generalized inflammatory response in your body and it, they, they can confound the diagnosis of heart disease as some of the symptoms are similar, but they also can affect your arteries like two to ten times more common, commonly in women. Now, breast cancer, uh, we're having some really great research right here in Winnipeg on breast cancer, uh, surviving breast cancer and, and living with the effects of radiation and chemotherapy. Now, radiation on the left side of the chest can cause some uh, issues with the heart muscle itself later on in life and also chemotherapy. There's a certain... Um, chemotherapy drug that um, in certain doses can cause some issues with heart muscle. So knowing that these are um, something going forward, it's, it becomes more important to modify your other risk factors and to keep your heart healthy. Chronic kidney disease um, sometimes arise from high blood pressure disorders of pregnancy or gestational diabetes. So chronic kidney disease actually puts your heart at risk as well. Um, one of the breaking news stories of 2019 and 2020 is that depression and stress uh, put women at higher risk than men. There's a growing evidence that these psychological factors and emotional stress can affect the onset and clinical course of ischemic heart disease, especially in women after a heart attack. Um, so you have to take care of yourself after a heart attack. And it's, it is two times more common in women than in men. Now, stress. Um, we all know that uh, women are stretched quite a bit these days um, with responsibilities of work and then unpaid work at home and family responsibilities. So that does contribute to uh, cardiovascular disease as well. 
So now reproductive health history. So there are a few things which are becoming sort of hot topics. Um, things like uh, early onset or early menarche, so early onset of, of periods in, in young girls, um, gestational hypertension or enclampsia and preeclampsia kind of foreshadow um, the need for managing high blood pressure later in life and, and managing the risk of heart disease. Uh, gestational diabetes mellitus or gestational diabetes. Um, Preterm delivery, um, of course, using uh, reproductive hormones for hormone replacement therapy uh, in premature menopause. Um, th those are controversial subjects which are being uh, researched now. Um, the use of oral contraceptives and smoking, we all know that it contributes to stroke, but it also has an effect on heart health later in life. So just a little note, um, I love this picture because this is the only picture I was able to find with Karen's help that actually had a woman's silhouette in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sorry if it offends anybody, but there, there's not very many uh, women's silhouettes for heart disease. So I'm glad we found one. Um, so there's a difference between coronary artery disease and ischemic heart disease. So coronary artery disease is pretty specifically um, about the vascular health of your heart arteries. And those are the arteries that run on the outside of your heart. Um, and those are the ones that we look at when we take you to the heart cath lab. Now ischemic heart disease is a bit of a more broad umbrella term and it seems to apply more specifically to women. And it's, um, disease that is the coronary arteries, the microcirculation, so the smaller arteries, and then maybe an imbalance of the oxygen supply and demand to the heart muscle itself. Um, women have a lower prevalence of those big arteries being plugged um, and having the, you know, the big heart attack, you know, clutching the chest and, and calling 911 and, and uh, going to St. Boniface to get your arteries looked at. Women have a, a less incidence of that. They ha seem to have um, uh, more uh, gentle, not maybe gentle sy symptoms, but less specific uh, symptoms because their disease is sort of in the smaller arteries of the heart, not necessarily those, those large ones. So this is a picture, and I'm sorry if it's a little fuzzy. Um, but here I'll go over here and I'll so so traditional coronary artery disease uh, was started with this top left hand corner. It's it's this is a picture of plaque rupture. So in uh, athero atherosclerotic heart disease, so when cholesterol accumulates on the inside of heart arteries, um, plaque forms. Um, then it becomes brittle, cracks, and uh, potentially a clot forms, which either totally uh, a blocks flow of the blood to the heart muscle or partially blocks flow to the heart muscle. That's kind of that traditional heart attack I was talking about. Um, so this does happen in women and men. Uh, this is the kind of heart attack that we treat with medications or with going to the heart cath lab and having a stent placed um, and, and, or a bypass surgery. Um, and this, that, that's sort of what common heart attack, uh, picture of a heart uh, of an artery looks like. The next one down is called plaque erosion and we seem to see a lot of women that have this sort of a syndrome and it's plaque but it's it's not necessarily a, a crack in the plaque it might just be that bits of the plaque break off and go farther downstream and seem to block smaller arteries downstream and there's still symptoms of a heart attack but they are milder or uh, less specific to that you know, squeezing, crushing pain in the chest. Um, the next slide down is uh, the, it's called an in situ thrombus, which is a thrombus in between the layers of the, the heart arteries. Um, the bottom one is probably one of the, um, one of one of the syndromes that actually kick-started uh, investigation into women's heart health. It's called SCAD or uh, spontaneous, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And the heart arteries, as all arteries are, are made of layers and they have um, 
if, if the inside layer tears or the intima tears, um, there can be a, a, a potential space in there. It can dissect and it can cause the same similar um, symptoms of a heart attack, but there's no cholesterol plaque in there to rupture. And these type of um, dissections don't do well or don't do as well with stenting per se. Um, and women are very disproportionately represented in this diagnosis. So now on the top right hand corner, we've got like a supply demand mismatch where uh, in cases of stress where there is um, a lot of circulating, we call them catecholamines, like epinephrine, that kind of a thing during stress, we have a lot of demand and not enough supply of, of oxygen to the heart muscle. Uh, the next one down is uh, coronary vasospasm. Now, all the heart arteries run on the outside of the heart, and they are at risk to spasm, especially when exposed to stress or to nicotine, uh, those kind of things. And um, the interesting thing about this is that when we have all the regular heart symptoms, the pain in the chest and whatnot, we take uh, the patient to the heart cath lab and we don't see anything. We actually see very clear coronaries or heart arteries. Um, so that's something that is, is a bit more common in women. Now the bottom one is uh, where we're doing some research now and it's called uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction. So it's very small arteries um, and veins in the heart muscle itself and it just means that the heart isn't getting enough flow to the actual muscle cells. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, about this one specifically. So I did talk a little bit about spontaneous coronary artery uh, dissection or SCAD and it is defined as the sudden separation between the layers of a coronary artery wall. 80% of SCAD patients are female with an average age of about 42 years. So the management of this disease process is quite different. Uh, we need to do a lot more research on this um, and, and it, it is coming, it is coming. The other type of unique syndrome with women is called stress cardiomyopathy. It's a kind of a big word. Um, the other word for it or the other name for it is called Takasubo cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. And it's Takasubo because um, that's the shape of uh, an octopus, believe it in believe it or not, in Japan, that's where it was first described, and uh, octopus in a pot, believe it or not. And so what happens in uh, stress of cardiomyopathy is that the ventricles, or the lower pumping portions of the heart, become dysfunctional, and they have some wall, mo wall motion abnormalities, um, and usually it's preceded by extreme physical or emotional triggers, and in postmenopausal women. Um, so it, it also does look a bit like a heart attack when we look at an ECG and we look at the blood work and whatnot, but the coronary arteries, the heart arteries are fine, um, but the heart is not pumping properly. So that's uh, also one that we're researching a bit too. Whoops, sorry. The next one is coronary microvascular dysfunction, and it's described as limitary, limited heart blood flow reserve and um, endothelial dysfunction. So what just what that means is that the in, the linings of the heart arteries um, don't relax as well as they can. Um, they can get uh, hard. Um, they can have more diffuse atherosclerotic disease um, in men when men have uh, heart attacks, I'm generalizing here, um, but there is usually a area that is the culprit area within the heart arteries that um, can be stented or bypassed or, or whatnot. We're finding that women have more kind of lumpy coronary arteries, so less uh, distinct um, plaques and more diffuse disease. And, and they also have a bit more arterial stiffness and fibrosis. Um, their heart uh, remodels different after a heart attack. So we can have this, this uh, dysfunction of getting the blood to those very fine uh, uh, vessels and, in, and to, to the heart muscle itself. So the, the trouble is when we look at an angiogram, um, we see very large vessels. Um, it's sort of like 
getting the plumbing, getting the water to your house. We can see those big vessels uh, when we're in the heart cath lab, but we can't see those really fine vessels. There are uh, developing technologies and, and diagnostic tests um, that uh, we're using to do to look at that microvascular uh, network, um, sort of like looking inside your house where the blood's, you know, where the water's flowing. Um, but it's it's coming, it's coming, it, and we're in in the middle of some really interesting research uh, and application of of that data and that information. Um, the next one is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, this is an interesting one because it is um, it, it's not as well researched as we would like. Uh, women do, if they're diagnosed with this, exhibit a worse quality of life after this type of heart failure. Um, and more often uh, uh, exhibit depression. Um, it's, it's poorly understood entity and it disproportionately does affect women, especially elderly women. There is another kind of heart failure, which is um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which we are pretty darn good at treating. Um, and so more research into treatment of this uh, sort of unique syndrome is, is needed. Now POTS. POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's kind of a mouthful. And it's a condition that affects circulation or blood flow. Um, and it involves the automatic autonomic nervous system. So that flight or fight response. So that epinephrine surge that you get. Um, and this that system automatically controls, you know, if you're jogging, your heart rate goes up. If you're resting, your heart rate goes down. And so, um, sorry, then that's the sympathetic nervous system. Sorry about that. Um, and this does affect women that are younger. Um, and so when what happens is when um, people go from lying to standing, uh, your blood has to be pressurized in order to, you know, now get up to your to your noodle. Um, and your heart does speed up to do that to help pressurize your 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 system. Um, but disproportionately in, in this syndrome, um, heart rate goes up, but not necessarily blood flow goes up. So you have dizziness and, 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 um, and actually fainting and all that kind of thing happen. And then the last one is vasospasm or uh, microthromboembolism. So, um, oops, sorry, I lost my spot there. So, these are also um, difficult. Vasospasm happens in a, in a uh, finite period of time. If we can catch it in the heart cath lab, we can see it, but sometimes we, we can't. We just have to presume that it's, it's vasospasm. Um, microthromboembolism, like I said, we can sometimes catch it when we do some specific diagnostic tests to look at that, the small vessels of uh, the heart. Um, but once again, it's it's an evolving technology and evolving treatment algorithm for these things. So like I said, I'm not talking about these because I think I've talked like quite enough about a lot of all this other stuff. Um, so we'll carry on. So diagnosis and treatment. Um, traditional symptoms are chest pain. You know, I'm having the I'm having the big one. Um, chest pressure, pain radiating up the neck and jaw, pain radiating down the arm. Heart and Stroke Foundation and American Heart did a fantastic job of, of letting everybody know that that's sort of what typical chest pain is. Unfortunately, it's very much more typical male chest pain. Uh, women tend to have some non-traditional symptoms, which uh, include lightheadedness, unusual fatigue, indigestion, neck, arm, shoulder pain. Uh, here are a lot of women that have back pain, pain between their shoulder blades. Um, heaviness in the arms rather than pain, and, and maybe even upper ab abdominal pain. Now, because these are non-traditional symptoms, there's a bit of a delay in, you know, diagnosing a heart attack. Um, we have an algorithm in the WRHA that if somebody comes in with chest pain, they get uh, an ECG within 10 minutes of arrival in an, in an emergency or urgent care. So if they don't have those specific symptoms there's a delay in care and time is muscle really when it comes to heart and then we also tend to think of um, you know men over the age of 45 um, and women over the age of 55 as having uh, increased risk for uh, 
you know, heart attack. And if you've had early menopause, if you've had um, uh, surgery that has affected your, your hormones, your reproductive health, that marker may be much earlier. And so if you're, you know, a 45 year old with non-traditional symptoms, you may not get an ECG right away, which is what we need to, to diagnose um, uh, ischemic heart disease or, or coronary artery disease. Um, we find that women, there is a delay in presentation as well. Um, women often minimize their symptoms. They put their social role or responsibilities ahead of seeking medical attention. Um, there is that delay in recognition because of the non-standard symptoms. Um, often we see women diagnosed with, with indigestion or depression uh, when uh, presenting with non-traditional symptoms. And then even when they're diagnosed with a uh, heart attack or uh, coronary artery disease, they're treated less intensely than men before and after their, their diagnosis. So when we diagnose um, heart disease uh, or ischemic heart disease, you have to have a good story. So you have to have that pain. Uh, I have pain and then we get you an ECG and then we do some blood work. And that's kind of our, you know, definitive, yes, you're having a heart attack and we're going to book an ambulance to St. Boniface and get you to the heart cath lab to see what's going on. Um, and the, that treatment is an angiogram and then a decision whether there's a stent or a bypass or something like that to, to help uh, to help treat this. And so, because we have um, we have different anatomy, we have different risk factors. There, like I said, there is a delay. Um, so we need to get better at acknowledging uh, that women's risks are different, that women's symptoms are different, that women's presentations are different. And also, even our response, women's responses to standardized exercise tests are different than men's, so it can make interpretation a bit diff difficult as well. So if you might have guessed, there are some gaps, some heart health gaps with women. Um, awareness of women's heart disease is, is kind of lacking. Um, we need to have more of an open dialogue with healthcare providers and patients to understand the risks, similarities, and differences. Um, we've done a good job of, uh, just actually there was an article in the Free Press on Monday about three researchers at St. Boniface Hospital um, doing a fantastic job. So we are funding researchers, but I think we need more. Um, and they, these researchers should be playing an active role in um, the knowledge translation from that research and to the use at point of care to help diagnose and treat um, these specific women's heart issues. Um, healthcare providers should be uh, educated at an early level that there are gender differences. Um, it would be great if we could identify systems to implement these diagnoses uh, at, and at, as these treatment options come available. Um, a lot of people are unaware of these female risk factors, especially those ones that were sort of these novel ones. And I would encourage the women listening to this uh, webinar to talk with your family doctor. I mean, I've changed family doctors probably two or three times um, in my life, and I'm not sure my family doctor knows everything about me. Um, so that's where getting to know your family doctor and letting them know you is, is important as well so that they can help you manage risk. Um, and like I said, under under supported, um, I think depression is is just a, a huge emerging risk factor. I think we need to rely on each other. I think we need to uh, contact community resources. At the wellness here, we have a Get Better Together program where we connect survivors uh, uh, to support each other. Um, and like I said, we need to do a lot more research to. Uh, get into clinical practice. Now that sounds all a bit doom and gloom, but there is a lot of great things. Um, there's cardiac rehab, so I'm, I'm a bit of a you know salesman when it comes to cardiac rehab. It can be really crucial for women's physical and emotional recovery from heart disease. Um, it's a It can be a group. Um, we can do a, a sort of a home program as well. Um, but the uh, the Heart and Stroke Heart Report found that women are only half as likely to attend cardiac rehab and then follow up with the rehab program. And it, that's because of a social and economic reasons. Um, 
we get a lot of women referrals, but we don't find that women come to cardiac rehab. So we need to work on why that is and maybe have a home-based program for them. Um, so it says 39% of women completed cardiac rehab, which is sort of a low number. Um, of course, medical treatments need to get better. Diagnostic testing needs to get better. Uh, we all need to advocate for ourselves. So when we're talking to our family physicians about our own health, heart health, um, you know, if your blood sugar is high, if your blood pressure is high, um, be an advocate for your, yourself and, and say, what are we going to do about it? What are the things I can do about it between visits to get my blood pressure down, to get my blood sugar down, um, to, to quit smoking, to control my weight, things that are important, so important, modifiable to, to heart health risk. Um, and because I'm a ACLS and BLS instructor and it is heart month, um, I challenge you to talk with other women about heart health uh, and heart disease. Learn CPR because it's not just for you, it's for your, your community and your family and, and everyone in your life. Uh, it is really, really important. Now, I know I've talked really fast and I've used some pretty big words here and there, um, but I do have some resources on the next slide. Uh, this is just a lovely, um, picture from the American Heart Association about the simple uh, risk factors or the seven approaches to staying heart healthy. So uh, over here where it is, uh, be active, keep a healthy weight, learn about cholesterol, which is over here, your high density lipoproteins and your low de density lipoproteins, eat a heart healthy diet, um, don't smoke or use uh, smokeless tobacco, uh, keep your blood pressure healthy and keep it, keep knowing what your numbers are. Keep your, uh, make sure that you know what your blood sugar is and limiting alcohol. Of course, that's, that's also very important. So here is, these are some women's heart health resources. So uh, there's a couple of reports for heart and stroke dot, at, at heartandstroke.ca. I encourage you to, to go to that website. It's fantastic. They're really advocating for uh, women's heart research. And then the Ottawa Heart Institute has actually a, a, an entire web page and an entire clinic dedicated to women's heart health. Uh, so does the Cleveland Clinic, but um, the, the website was down the other day, so I couldn't copy the, uh, the website link, but the Cleveland Clinic, um, also has a fantastic resource for uh, women's heart health. And then uh, there's a couple of um, Centers for Disease Control uh, uh, links in uh, heart disease uh, about women as well. So thank you all for listening. I hope I didn't talk too fast, but we do have some time for some questions if you're interested. Well, thanks so much, uh, Kendra. I've certainly gleaned lots of good new information. That was a lot uh, of, of uh, helpful helpful information and lots of big words, uh, at least for me, that I haven't come across that much in, in my work life here. But we have a few questions from people who have been um, listening. The first one is, a uh, person has um, said that they've had a heart attack and asking if can um, cardiac rehab uh, revert their heart back to uh, pre-heart attack time? Like, can it, is it like a smoking cessation? If you quit smoking, can uh, you, um, you know, uh, uh, do your, you know, lungs clear after set amount of time after yeah. quitting smoking? Is the heart the same way? That's a very good question. And, and unfortunately, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, it depends on the size of the heart attack. Um, it depends on... Um, how, like how much muscle is damaged, uh, what muscle is damaged. Um, so it's, it's really individualized. Uh, what cardiac rehab can do is, first of all, it's going to support you to get back moving again in a safe environment so that you feel safe um, getting active and moving again. Um, moving helps decrease blood pressure. It helps increase high density lipoproteins, which are great for heart health. It um, decreases blood sugar or helps maintain a healthy blood sugar. Um, it increases lung capacity, which if you have got good lung capacity, it's gonna help uh, oxygen delivery to your heart. So 
we found that depending on you know the size of the heart attack and where the heart attack is cardiac rehab helps all of those things it helps people sort of decrease their medications potentially uh, if that's a goal for you um, it also does help make your heart stronger so that uh, if you have that number that you've been given the ejection fraction we can help it does help increase ejection fraction and therefore helps you feel better um, Unfortunately, after a heart attack, your, your, your heart muscle doesn't regenerate fully, but what we do is we help the rest of the heart muscle around that sort of scar remodel properly and contribute to uh, effective heart pumping. I hope that answers the question a bit. Well, thanks, Kendra. Um, not sure if you um, are able to answer this question, but one of our participants um, has indicated that they're involved in the warm heart study at uh, University of Manitoba. And they're asking if there's any other local studies that you know of that they might be able to participate in addition to this warm heart study. You know what, I'm not uh, really familiar with more heart studies but uh so this is the article from the free press just the other day with the researchers from saint boniface which is the sort of the the call to women over the age of 55 to participate in um, heart research and i don't specifically but i think you can probably contact heart and stroke uh to see if there is um any specific heart uh research that you would want to be a part of i think it's fantastic we do need more women willing to go into studies um, answer surveys about our health uh, so we can get more information uh, about how to treat what kind of symptoms or predromal um, uh, health issues kind of lead to certain syndromes and the more information we have from for more women, the, the better. So that's fantastic that uh, you're involved in that study because uh, we're doing some groundbreaking stuff here at, at St. B. Uh, this one is a person relaying that they're at a higher risk for um, a heart attack and wondering if there are any sort of pre-diagnostic tests to detect um, like heart arteries and things like this. For example, you mentioned SCAD. Uh, is there a pre-diagnostic test to see where you're at or your arteries are at? So traditionally, um, if um, people were at higher risk for heart disease, we would do some sort of non-invasive tests. So ECGs, uh, stress tests or exercise stress tests. And um, those, like I said, are a little bit different in men and women. Um, we seem to, women's heart rates seem to, you know, either don't get high enough or, or get too high to, to do proper diagnostics with those kind of things. So that's usually where we start. Um, we don't take everybody to the heart cath lab. Um, and like I said, some of the syndromes that affect women just don't show up in the heart cath lab because they've happened at a point in time like the coronary vasospasm, the SCAD looks very different on an angiogram as well. Um, if you, you think about a, a plaque rupture and uh, looking at a heart artery, it looks like a pinched sausage actually. So it's kind of thick and then it pinches down and then it thickens up again. And, and that little spot is where we can put a stent. Um, that's for traditional coronary artery disease with plaque rupture. With SCAD, it's kind of it's it's a fuzzy picture um, because there's no huge clot potentially uh, there's just sort of a fuzziness around um, that dissection in the artery and and that's where we need the research because we don't know why it happens we don't necessarily um, we've we've learned that treating SCAD conservatively, uh, not with stenting potentially, is, is, a, is a way to go because um, those arteries do eventually heal and then managing risk going forward. Um, but, you know, those things are, they are a bit tough. They are, and that's why we need all this research now. 
Well, thanks very much, uh, Kendra. That's that's all the time we have for today for questions. So if you folks uh, find that you have some questions that weren't addressed today, uh, please feel free to contact us too. And we really appreciate you taking time out of your day and joining us. And we hope that you enjoyed the session and, and found it most informative and helpful as well. As I mentioned at the outset, the webinar will be recorded and you'll be sent the link directly to your email that you, you uh, registered to take this webinar. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with a friend, we encourage you to do so. It will also be up on the wellnessinstitute.ca, our website, in a few days. Uh, it will be up there with uh, our other webinars, which you can go and listen to, that will be archived. So again, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, hope you're able to go outside and enjoy the sunshine and uh, hope you might be able to join us for a webinar that we hold again in the future. And thanks so much for Kendra uh, for doing a, a great webinar today. Appreciate that. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.